25, 2005, to order. At this time, please uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there um, any changes to the order of the agenda for my fellow council members from staff? Uh, no, Madam Mayor. Is there anyone here from the public that wishes to make any changes to the agenda? Okay, next item on our agenda this evening is council reports. The uh, first item under council reports is the appointment of city manager, of an interim city manager beginning August 1, 2005, and a resolution that actually is contained within our staff packets um, that needs actually to be passed. At this time, I'd actually... Um, it's my pleasure to announce that Brian Moore, our assistant city manager, will be has graciously accepted to be our interim city manager until we're um, we're able to complete the negotiations and hire in a permanent city manager. And uh, in recognition of his stepping up and doing that, um, th we we're looking to pass a resolution actually that uh, Brian shall be awarded a one-time bonus in the amount of five thousand dollars for his uh, his efforts there. So uh, is there a motion from my fellow council members for this resolution? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Christine, is there a number actually? Yes, there is, which I don't have right now. <laughs> um, it's next in order. Because, okay. Um, I'll get the number. Um, council member Eaton? Yes. Council member K King? Yes. <clears throat> council member Davids? Yes. Council member Grocott? Yes. Mayor Tegel Doherty? Yes. Thank you very much, Brian. We appreciate your work and, and all your efforts in that. And no, you'll do a great job. Thank you. Uh, next item this evening on our council reports is a report on the analysis of fire service options for San Carlos. Um, Brian, I understand you're going to have a brief staff report, and then we do have our acting fire chief, Chuck Loudon, here in the audience as well to, to fill us in. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and members of council. I thought I'd give you an update on our fire service uh, proposal project, and then the chief is here as well, as you indicated, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, there have been several developments uh, in recent weeks on the project. First of all, I'm happy to report uh, that the interim city manager in Belmont, Jack Christ, and I have negotiated an extension to Chuck's tenure with the city. Uh, he will now be with us at least through January and perhaps a little longer until we're able to uh, start up the new service arrangements. You will probably recall that uh, we originally had a one-year uh, agreement with uh, Mr. Loudon, and that uh, was coming up in October. I think it was my feeling and also Mr. Chris's feeling that uh, it was very important to keep Chuck on until that process is complete. Um, I should mention that Chuck did uh, add one proviso to his uh, agreement to stay, and that is that he will stay as long as we're making progress on the project, uh, and I think that's a fair uh, proviso to have. And I know uh, we've certainly gotten similar direction from your council subcommittee of Mr. Eaton and Mr. King, and uh, so I'm working with Chuck on a regular basis, and we're moving this project along. I think as far as the, the four uh, uh, proposals, as you, and in some of this is probably a re, uh, repeat for you, but just to go through the highlights, I think all four proposals uh, offer a level of service that is slightly higher than what we have in San Carlos today. Um, most of them envision using most, if not all, of our existing South County Fire staff, and I think that's a plus. We can continue to use the experienced staff that we have. Each of the proposals, however, has a series of options within it, so one of the things that we're looking at right now is analyzing them. I think it's fair to say that given San Carlos does have uh, some budget challenges in the general fund, as, as the council well knows, we have a $1.8 million structural deficit, and we're going to try to close half of that this year, that we are spending most of our time analyzing those fire service options within each of the proposals that are around or less than what we're paying for fire service today, that being roughly $4.9 million. Um, Chuck and I have met recently to review all of the options. We have questions and things that we would like to raise with the different proposers, and so we are proposing to meet with the key agencies in the next couple of weeks to answer our questions and refine the numbers a bit. And once we have that additional detail, uh, we're planning to meet with your council subcommittee of Mr. King and Mr. Eaton to begin to have a discussion of narrowing the proposals a bit. Uh, we're also planning to involve the fire management staff and the fire staff to hear their perspective on the four proposals. It's my understanding that they have some input on the, the pros and cons of the different proposals, and we'd like to hear that as we move forward. 
Uh, and then we uh, would envision uh, beginning to narrow the number of options and, and uh, agencies and ultimately begin working on negotiating an agreement for service starting early next year, hopefully as, as early as January. I also wanted to report that uh, another piece of this puzzle is dissolving South County Fire Authority itself. As you probably will recall, last December when you uh, took action to protect the city's interest, we hired a special legal counsel, Joan Kassman. Joan is working with Chuck and I, as well as Gene Savory, who is the South County Fire Counsel, and a gentleman named Michael Colantuano, who is the Belmont Special Counsel. And we're going through a, a laundry list of items uh, needed to complete between now and the end of June of next year to wrap up South County Fire. We've agreed on the disposition of the property and buildings, so we're now moving on to other items, including the vehicles, the equipment, assets, liabilities, claims, et cetera. And we're meeting once or twice a month. That remains on track. And I think, again, we, uh, I anticipate that we will be uh, able to meet the June deadline. So that's kind of where we are. We're continuing to make progress. We're continuing to work with the Council Subcommittee to get to policy direction. And uh, again, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be able to bring some uh, more specific items to you in the months ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Chief Lowen, do you have uh, anything you'd like to add to that? Please come on up and uh, fill us in. I'll walk up and just to say no. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Chuck Loudon, Fire Chief, South County Fire Authority. I'd be pleased to answer any questions that the Council may have. I think Brian did a great job outlining what we've been doing over the past month or so. Okay. Well, we certainly appreciate your efforts. I know that uh, fire protection is certainly of grave concern here in San Carlos, and we want to make sure that it transitions as smoothly as possible. So thank you very much for your work there, and um, we appreciate the frequent updates as well. Thanks. Okay. Um, actually, other council reports this evening. Um, the one area I'd like to bring up is that our August – Eighth meeting, we're going to have two council members who aren't going to be able to make that meeting, and we had tentatively agreed as a council to, um, for our quote unquote summer vacation, uh, not have our August 22nd meeting. So, do we want to perhaps consider switching? Do we know who's going to be here on August 22nd? I will not. I will not. You so will or you will not? Two well, members missing on August, August 20th. On the 8th. What about the 22nd? Would be here for the I would be here on the 20th. I'd be here on both of them. So. Okay. Okay, so. And the rationale is we'd have a quorum, but if. If one of us gets sick or anything, then, then, yeah, we're. So this way we'll have. Ample. Okay, so we will go ahead and cancel at this time our August. Reschedule 8th. I'm sorry, reschedule the items for the 8th to August 22nd. Okay. And uh, plan to not have a meeting on the 8th. Okay, other uh, other council reports. Tom, do you want to start? Oh, uh, just mention uh, where we stand with the SBSA uh, recruitment of a general manager. Uh, we are meeting on Wednesday morning, and we will uh, hopefully employ a recruiting firm to uh, go out and beat the bushes for the very best man or woman. And that process will continue um, for the next several months. So just for those of us who are in the public that don't know what SB. SBSA, that's SA South Bay Side Systems Authority, which is our water treatment plant. It's where all of our sewer water goes and gets processed <laughs> and um, returns to good use, either in the bay or in landscape strips or wherever it ends up. Okay, but, um, thank you very much for that. It's very, it's a big job, and we're, uh, and we're anxious to get in and, and find just the right person. Okay, great. Matt, did you have anything? Um, two items. One, I just wanted to recognize uh, our our uh, city treasurer, Michael Galvin, who's in the audience. And thank you, Michael, for the wonderful memorial service uh, for your daughter, Christy. It was, um, I would just like to say you have a wonderful family and you bring uh, honor to your, your daughter's memory. And it was uh, a privilege to attend the service. Um, and I say that, I think, on behalf of the full council. I think most of us were there. Um, the other item I wanted to bring to the attention of the council, we did get a letter from the Britain Heights Homeowners Association, and they're having uh, troubles with uh, BFI pickup at, at that uh, uh, complex, and they're having trouble with uh, damage to their, their property, uh, having timely pickup, uh, or getting the, the recycling picked up at all. And the, the <clears throat> conclusion of their letter, they're actually asking that we might consider as a council to have their um, recycle uh, 
waste picked up by another contractor other than BFI. I don't necessarily see that happening, but I do want to bring the, this letter to the attention of everyone, and uh, I suppose we'll be getting some kind of report or action from the staff on this. That yeah, it has it has been actually referred to staff already, okay. Matt. Very good. And that's it. All right. The done. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I've got three items. Uh, one is to let you know that at the last Association of Bay Area Governments meeting, which I'm one of the county's two representatives for cities, uh, the primary topic of conversation, if I don't lose it here, um, was transportation-oriented transportation development and the financing that is available through ABAG, or the Association of Bay Area, Bay Area Governments, and how they act as a conduit for uh, funds that can be uh, processed through to people who develop transportation-oriented housing. And I think in light of uh, the possibilities that we will have some significant projects here in San Carlos, that we just need to be mindful of that. Secondly, um, to update um, everyone, Council Member Grocott, or Vice Mayor Grocott and I have been working on a building department ad hoc committee uh, looking at our building department, examining a number of issues, anything from just policies on enforcement to second unit amnesty to uh, staffing to garage conversions to service hours, A-frame signs, which we've already dealt with here, fence enforcement, riparian setbacks, a bunch of things that relate to the building department, and some of which interact with the planning department and how that functions. I think Matt and I both feel that our work as a subcommittee meeting in the way we have one-on-one, -on -one with, you know, so to speak, with Matt and I and the building department official uh, is generally done. And we are at a point where we would like to request you, Madam Mayor, to place that on, place a report from uh, the, the committee and Jack Ayala, who's our head building official, probably in the first meeting in September or something like that, and then we can take things from there. There are a number of items that we can summarize fairly quickly, we believe, and there are probably at least a couple items that may take an entire meeting to talk about. Uh, we may want to work those through the various uh, commissions of the city also, just to get their extra input, since that's what they're there for. But we think that it's time that we bring this forward and move on. So if you might keep that in mind, we would appreciate that. Okay. Um, I will have Christine take a look at the agenda for that first meeting in September. And assuming that we don't have something horrendous, absolutely we'll get on that meeting. Okay. And then lastly, as a function of uh, the most recent 2 plus 2 committee meeting, uh, which you and I, Madam Mayor, serve on, uh, and 2 plus 2 is two representatives of the city council and two representatives of our local school board, uh, where we sit down and talk about issues in common and where we can help each other that way. Uh, as a result of this most recent meeting, uh, the city staff has been putting in quite a bit of work on uh, just talking about uh, what's going to potentially happen this fall with regard to transportation efforts and how potentially significant those issues could be with, with the uh, loss of scoot. And I would also like to request you put on a future agenda, whether it be 1st of September, whether it be end of August, I don't care, um, a specific item where we have a report from staff on what their efforts have been, so we can certainly make that public. Uh, Patty Wool, the superintendent of, of schools, uh, is on vacation right away, I understand, but we should probably coordinate with her also so that she could be in attendance if she'd like to. And I'd certainly like input from uh, uh, Chief of Police Greg Rothis and our Public Works Director uh, Parvis Mokhtari on that topic also. So if you would also keep that in mind. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Christine? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike? We have one report. Uh, Tom's graciously, uh, we're meeting number 11 or 12, I believe. And uh, um, just as an aside, not part of the report, but Tom has been sharing it. Done. Uh, we're getting into a very difficult weighing back and forth of various opinions, and it's done a masterful job of keeping us on track and getting away from the polarizations. We are getting people to vent. Would you not agree, Tom, even though you are the chair? Huh? I think it's going well, yes. And to that end, we had two results. One, we've come forward with 18 values uh, set upon and agreed to by the committee, uh, which is monumental to get everybody to agree to, to these as the order of priority. And secondly, uh, we'll have a very detailed matrix report on the evaluation of fields to include field turf, lights, 
uh, aesthetics, uh, and basically the nine elements that are contained in the general plan as to it will be a very useful tool to um, uh, help us evaluate a, a very thorny decision. It has been designed by one of the members of the, the committee, and, and I might say it's a, it's a well-done piece of work. Don't you think, Tom? Yeah, very good. Very good. And hopefully when we get it finalized, we'll put it on the web and it'll be available for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any um, idea when that committee might be drawing to a close? Mr. Chairman? Well, <laughs> uh, perhaps by uh, first part of October, maybe? We have at least three, maybe four more. Right, We're getting so. into the nitty-gritty now. So. so that sounds like good progress has been is being made there. Okay. Anything else? All right. I don't have anything to add. Um, I did want to actually jump back. I realized I skipped over item 3A, which is a report, report from closed session. Um, Direction was given to staff for our two closed session items. However, no action was taken. Uh, council presentations. I'm actually very proud tonight to be able to present a plaque in honor um, to Larry Seawright, who is a retiring tra traffic and transportation uh, commission member. Larry actually has been on the traffic and transportation for three consecutive three-year terms, so a total of nine years, which is very commendable. I'm sure he would be honored and pleased to continue to serve on our traffic and transportation commission. However, we do have term limits on some of our commissions, and uh, unfortunately, this is one of them. So, Larry, having been termed out, we certainly have appreciated and valued all of your work over the last nine years. And let me come down and give you this presentation um, plaque for your wall at home. Thank you. Do you want to say a couple of Sure. Things? I told my wife it had been nine years and she said I was crazy. I'd like to thank the staff of uh, San Carlos who have been so supportive of the Traffic and Transportation Commission and so helpful, and of course the City Council that uh, over the past few years have given the Traffic and Transportation Commission a, a real head up to, to do the things they're supposed to do. Uh, I tried to give something to the city. That's what I told you when I asked for the position, but I always got more out of it than I could ever give. And it was a, it'll be a nice memory forever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I don't know quite how to uh, how to begin with this. The next proclamation, actually, it's a proclamation to Michael Garvey, who is our retiring city manager. Mike's been with the city for 18 years, and during his tenure, has overseen so many tremendous changes within San Carlos. Um, I know personally, has helped drive a lot of the the key projects that we've had in town: grade separation, the library, the youth center the uh, downtown renovation, industrial road renovation, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And under his tenure, we've hired in some great people. We've rebuilt all of, uh, almost all of the roads. We've redone sewer, sewer systems and uh, really, really made a lot of improvements in the infrastructure here in San Carlos. And he's been, I think, a friend and a mentor and just a tremendous leader here in San Carlos. So it's with, obviously, some sadness. Um, that we're, we're wishing Mike the best as he moves on to this next thing in his career. Um, and uh, I know Mike and his wife Linda and family live in town and will continue to stay active in the community. So he's not really leaving, leaving, but uh, Mike, you know, thank you for all the work and all the effort and all the time and vision and leadership over the last 18 years. And I'm going to. Uh, give this proclamation to Mike for his wall. Again, it's bigger. I'm sorry, Larry, but <laughs> he's been here for, for 18 years. Uh, I'd just like to thank the council and uh, uh, and I'll mostly thank the community. It's been a wonderful place to be for all these years. Uh, recently, I spoke with a government professional who uh, urged me to leave San Carlos over 10 years ago. He came through San Carlos and spent some time here. And uh, at the end of it, he said, I know why you stayed. This is a very special place indeed. 
So I think it's wonderful that people are saying nice things about me, but um, I'm humbled by how many people were involved in each of those successes and what a wonderful community this is. But I get the plaque, they don't. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Mike, I know you'll uh, do great things wherever you end up um, in this next chapter in your career. So I wish you all the best. All right, moving on. Public comments. Um, this is a period of time limited to 10 minutes maximum. We had asked each speaker to speak no more than two minutes. And it's for people who would like to address the City Council on matters that are not on the posted agenda. I do have speaker slips from two individuals this evening. Uh, first, Cece Wilkerson, followed by uh, Andre Carpiu. Thank you, C.C. Wilkerson, San Carlos. And I just had a quick question. At the last meeting, um, and it happened really quickly, I wasn't really sure I caught it right, uh, Ms. Patterson had asked, was asking about several things, and the flooding situation in White Oaks came up, and that issue, I guess, is dead. And I was just wondering when that happened. I didn't remember hearing about it, so I was just wondering how that happened, if you know. Um, I'm sorry, which issue is that? For the flooding in the White Oaks area? I, it, she had asked about that, that project, and, and that was no longer a project? Brian, do you want to? Um, let me say a couple things about the uh, items that Ms. Patterson raised. Uh, we did have a meeting with her uh, between the, this, the last meeting and this meeting. Liz Collinan met with her, and it, Ben Parvis did, and we went through her issues. In the case of the... Uh, the White Oaks, uh, that project is still alive. However, it's on the unfunded list because there's not money at the moment to do it. Uh, as you council will recall about, I guess it was a year ago, we talked about doing a, a sort of a phase of it. And then as we got into it a little bit further, we concluded that even doing that phase wasn't going to get us where we wanted to go. So it's still something we like to do down the road, still very much alive. It's just not funded at the moment. But you know, hopefully at some point it will be. Right, and my understanding as well is that uh, staff is continuing to, to seek alternative options that may be less costly than, I remember what it was, it was in the millions of dollars to actually correct, um, correct it for once and for all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Andre Carpio, and then I do have another speaker slip from uh, Jane, I can't read the writing, Joe. I, I think Mr. Carpio uh, left, but I, I am going to schedule a meeting with him later this week. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, Jane? Thank you. And if you could just state your name and city of residence for the record, please. Yep. Uh, Mayor, City Council, Gene Jones, 115 Devonshire Boulevard, San Carlos. Um, I've had some ongoing issues with the building department. And no, I'm not looking for a permit. No, I'm not trying to remodel. None of that. Um, we've had some issues going on that stem back to January. They're proceeding and they're getting worse by each day. I've contacted the city manager's office, who I talked to Jeff uh, Mulby, who actually referred me to come to you because there doesn't seem to be a fix. Um, one of the issues that I'm having is a motorhome that's parked on my property. Um, no, it's not being down. No, it's not broken. Yes, it's registered, and it is behind a fence. Um, the issue was in March, someone miscellaneous call came in, and someone reported it as a problem. Um, the building department came out and told us that it was okay. It was signed off on the website, and it was a case closed. Four months later, Ms. Aiello, Mr. Aiello sent me a personal email on the 20th and said that that's not the case, it is an issue, and um, we're back at it all over again. Um, this is just one of the things. There's also something up from my garage that's a problem, and it just is nonstop. And I've tried every avenue possible to get resolution. Um, Mr. Aiello has told uh, Mr. Mulby that he's given me codes and how to fix it, which is not true. I've tried everything to resolve the problem, and I get absolutely nowhere, but I get more problems. Um, the last phone call that I got from Mr. Uh, Mulby um, stated to me that Mr. Aiello was, quote, my friend because he hadn't yet recommended that my fences be cut to four feet. So I'm sure after today's meeting, I'm sure there'll be more going on, and I just want it stopped. I mean, I'm not doing anything. I'm a prisoner in my own house, and I need your help to get out of it. I mean, it just makes no sense. Okay. Um, I'd like to refer this to Brian. For a follow-up, Brian, okay. perhaps you could take some time. Sure, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Give him your contact information, and then okay. we can uh, see what can be done. Okay, Thank you. perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Jewel Schrang. Sure. 
Oh, I'm sorry. You're under 9A, not public comment, right? Did you want to speak on that? Um, well, it, I should have put public comment. I, I wanted to just, I have a question. It's okay. just a real easy one. Sure, sure. Um, my name is Jewel Shang, and I reside at 1053 McHugh Avenue, San Carlos. And, Mayor, maybe you can help me with this. Um, in regard to 9A, I was just wondering how um, the City of Good Living, how the name of City of Good Living came about. It's... You know, I... I would uh, defer this to the wisdom of Mike Garvey, who is the keeper of all knowledge of such things here in San Carlos. Mike, do you have any idea? It appears to be a slogan adopted by the Chamber of Commerce and recommended to the city in the early 1960s. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Um, I received another speaker slip from uh, Brian Randall. Did you want to speak under public comment as well, or is it an item? Oh, okay, please feel free to come on up. My name is Brian Randall. I live in, live in Pearl Avenue, San Carlos. Uh, Madam Mayor, City Council members, ladies and gentlemen, I am speaking tonight about Margaret Peg Collier. She is owed money for work done and materials provided as requested by members of San Carlos City Council. As has become common in San Carlos City business, there was no contract. It was a verbal agreement, a gentleman's agreement. Now she is being prosecuted for a felony. She did as she was instructed. She has great loyalty to the council members. She is in poor health, 67 years old, and suddenly she is facing ruin. Will she be compensated at a later date for her work and materials she has paid for and provided? At this point in time, she appears to be the fall guy. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your, um, for your comments. Under uh, next item on our agenda this evening is the approval of the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine in nature and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or the public request specific items to be removed for separate actions. My fellow council members, are there any items you'd like to have removed for separate discussion? No. Yes, the warrant list. Um, that is at requesting item B be removed for separate uh, Discussion? Anyone else? Any member of the staff? Uh, no, Madam Mayor. And anyone from the public? All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve consent calendar items 7A and then C through F? Or I'll, move, I'll move approval of, of item 7A, C, D, E, which is adoption of ordinance 360, amending the San Carlos Municipal Code sign ordinance, and F. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Christine? Councilmember Davids? Yes. Councilmember King? Yes. Councilmember Eaton? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Mayor Tickle Doherty? Yes. Okay, Matt, you had a question regarding the warrant list expenditures. Yes, I, I simply wanted to pull this off um, because I don't feel in good conscience that I can vote uh, yes on it and approve it. It, it includes in a, a payment to uh, Mactari Engineering for 29154 and in light of discussions tonight and whether or not Mr. McTarry was overpaid on his contract the last couple of years, I can't uh, vote yes to approve uh, paying him money uh, in the future. So I wanted to be able to vote no on it. That's why I pulled it. I'm, sp I'm sorry, specifically what page are you talking about? Of the warrant list? Of the warrant list. Uh, this is on page two, looks like to me. Yeah, it's page two. And these are for the uh, the work that he's done as the public works director. Correct. And so you're you don't believe that he's actually done the work? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, I 
it's not that I don't believe he's done this work. It's the question I have tonight about whether he has been overpaid uh, for work done in 0203 and in 0304, the item that's on our agenda tonight. For I'm sorry, I didn't realize that that was under question. It is to me, so. All right. Is there a motion? I move approval of item. Um, where are we? Consent calendar item two? Uh, yeah, item two. 7B. 7B. I'm, yes, second. So moved and seconded. Uh, Christine? Councilmember Davids? Yes. Councilmember King? Yes. Councilmember Eaton? Yes. Councilmember Brokaw? No. Mayor Tiggle Doherty? Yes. Uh, next up on our agenda item this evening is uh, item eight. It's a public hearing for consideration of amending the San Carlos Municipal Code, Chapter 18.30, Multifamily Residential Districts Ordinance to amend, eliminate zoning sections, and to add additional language to clarify the definition intent and to add design review guidelines. Um, at our dais this evening, we did receive a copy of the actual um, amended ordinance that's being proposed for adoption, and what was in our staff report actually included the, uh, the strikeout so that it would be more easily um, discussed. Is there a staff report this evening? Um, Mayor, before we start on that item, there, the staff indicates they're having some technical difficulties with 8A, so they'd like to switch 8A and 8B, if that's okay with you? Um, well, 8B actually is, is just being continued, so. Okay. <laughs> so you'd like us to open the public hearing for 8B, continue the item while you're continuing to work with? Yeah, we should be ready to go in about one minute, so. Okay. It's just all right. when there was public comment. I'm looking at legal counsel. Can we do this? Have two public hearings open at the same time? Sure. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, public hearing item 8B, um, which is consideration of an appeal for an application for a Stern Taller Bakery. My understanding from staff is that um, this item is not ready to be heard, however, was noticed. So what we'd like to do is um, get a motion to continue this item to the August 22nd meeting. I'd move item 8B continue to August 22nd. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Do we need, I guess, all, this, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Do we need to close the public hearing? Then? No, we, because the public hearing has been opened, so it continue. will be op left open right. okay. to the next meeting. Okay, staff, are you ready to, for us to jump back to 8A here, which is the uh, multifamily residential district ordinance? Yes, thank you. Shana, actually, before we do this, dim the lights so that the presentation is easier for people to see. I can catch it. Okay, thank you. So tonight, the council is considering a series of amendments, including the addition of design guidelines to the existing multifamily ordinance. The 2004-2005 adopted planning department budget and work program did include development of formal design guidelines for multifamily development. Uh, staff also took this opportunity to make some other non-substantive uh, ordinance amendments to clarify and consolidate existing regulations. Planning Commission did review and unanimously approve the uh, draft design guidelines with a series of recommendations that were included for consideration at tonight's meeting. Proposed design guidelines attempt to codify the vision of the city as expressed in the 2001 downtown visualization study uh, to maintain a village or small town feel while providing a framework for applicants to implement in new multifamily development projects. Uh, without reference to specific architectural styles, this was an attempt to allow individual architectural creativity and innovation. There's four components to the proposed design review guidelines. The first component is building articulation, facade design. Uh, the intent of this component is to create visually interesting buildings, uh, vary, variation, and avoid the creation of monolithic or bulky buildings. A variety of ways to accomplish this um, is outlined, such as building and roof setbacks, uh, building recesses and projections, um, and other architectural detailing. Further, this guideline does highlight that special attention should be paid to street facades. The second component of the design guidelines is building materials and colors. The intent of this component is to assure high quality construction, long-term durability, and appearance of the buildings themselves. 
This component requires a minimum of two uh, earthen colors and encourages the use of a variety of materials where appropriate to the overall architectural style of the building. Third component is landscaping. The intent is to highlight the importance of landscaping as an integral part of the overall architectural style of buildings. Specifications on quantity, types, and location of landscaping is outlined. Um, again, the intent of the landscaping is to serve as a screening and softening mechanism to adjacent properties views from the public right of way as well as um, a complementary element to the building itself. Fourth component of the design guidelines has to do with parking areas. The intent of this component is to avoid having garage entries dominate the appearance of the building from public rights of way. This component requires parking areas to be screened and softened either through design and or a combination of landscaping and placement. Three items of public commentary were received. Um, one, uh, support for an increase in side yard setback requirements for new multifamily development. Uh, the second was concern with a uh, potential requirement of stepping in upper floors of new buildings. Third, uh, support was expressed for an increase to the existing height regulations. Staff did respond to all three of these public comments. Uh, first, in terms of the side yard setback requirements, it was explained that those requirements do increase as a proposed building height increases. And in terms of the stepping back of upper stories, it was outlined that this was not a um, requirement, that it was a supplement advisory regulation or, uh, excuse me, guideline, if appropriate to the overall style of a building. Uh, in terms of height exceptions, um, our planning commission did review potential height exceptions in detail and it, um, was unanimously decided to uh, leave the height requirements as is and not allow for any further exceptions. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for clarity purposes, staff recommends that the draft ordinance version be used to facilitate the discussion tonight. I'm available to answer any questions the council might have on the proposed design review guidelines. Planning director is available as well for any questions on the historical background with the uh, downtown visualization study or height studies that have been done in the past. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for staff? I have one, Madam Mayor. All right, Tom. So Stephanie, I think it's a great job and, and really reads um, much more, uh, much easier than it, than it did. And I like the, uh, the final part where you get into the design review guidelines. I think that's a real great addition. And I understand almost everything except on page three, there's some new terminology I haven't seen before, and it refers to setbacks. And it talks about seven and a half foot minimum side setback for the building from an exterior side property line, and a five foot minimum side setback from an interior side property line. So that's two and a half feet between the interior and the exterior, and I don't understand that. Uh, the intent of the difference between those setbacks, exterior side property lines are those for corner lots. An interior property line is one which is shared with an a, um, adjacent building. Oh. So for the intent is to step it back from public rights of way for those corner lot properties. So it's the, the seven and a half refers to a public right of way sure. lot or public right of way uh, reference. Uh, Correct, yes. Not, yeah. For you corner know, lots. Know I mean. right. 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 Okay. Fine. There's a front line and the side line. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's all I have. Um, I actually had uh, uh, two questions. The first actually has to do with, um, I'm curious why, I mean, the uh, urban downtown or downtown urban design guidelines were adopted in 2001, which was four years ago. Um, and at that time, you know, we were talking about preserving or enhancing this village or small town character. And I'm just curious to know if that's still relevant, um, given kind of what we're doing in San Carlos and the, the cost of, of land and everything else. Um, so perhaps you could speak, is there, have there been further studies talking about ne the necessity of preserving this, this village type of field? Because I don't necessarily <coughs> agree that that premise is still um, appropriate in its entirety, or just as a, as a statement. Well, since that time, the, the village feel, if you will, has been a policy that staff has tried to encourage with new multifamily development, as well as the Planning Commission has expressed favor with previous multifamily development projects that we've seen come through. Um, in terms of timing-wise, it was incorporated in, into the 2004-2005 um, uh, work program. We have just attempted to codify that as our work has permitted. So. Well, I'm, I'm just concerned with the that there may be a misnomer about this village feel or small town, as in 
like a two-story type of building when indeed I think there's there's going to be a trend towards higher densities and in fact a need for higher densities especially as it relates to multifamily housing within San Carlos so I find those two concepts a little bit um, at odds with each other and I um, I'm curious how um, how that language sort of shows up in the uh, um, in the ordinance that's being this before us today is it primarily in the new section uh, Section 050, which is the design review guidelines? Yes, it is primarily in the design review guidelines. All of the existing regulations that have been intact, if you will, since 2001 um, are remaining the same. There was no, nothing was taken out, nothing was added. There was some rewording for clarification purposes, but the regulations will remain the same. But it's the guidelines that are all new in this, in this version? Yes. Okay. And then my, um, my second question actually has to do with the design review guidelines section. Um, I noticed that there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of shells, and I'm concerned actually with the number of shells, and I'm wondering um, why there's, you know, as we look at ordinances, when it's a shell, it's a requirement. If it's a should, it's a recommendation. And guidelines to me are just that. They're, they're recommendations and guidelines to be looked at, not necessarily dictated on how buildings will be built, especially um, if it precludes or if it uh, somehow hampers the, if the ability of developers to make um, some cost-effective types of developments here in town. Can you talk to me about how some of these shells came about? I mean, I, I went through and one, two, three, four, I, I counted up six of them that to me were sort of nice-to-haves but not necessarily need-to-haves. Okay, well, the attempt of all the shells that are included in the, in the draft um, version Again, tying back to what was expressed in the 2001 visualization study, um, the sections that do refer to shall, uh, from staff's perspective, do still allow for some architectural creativity and really don't tie a developer or architect into a certain architectural style, um, allowing for some variation. So they're more, if you will, general um, they're, they're, guidelines. They're not general at all. I mean, in fact, in one of them, it says every building shall have at least two complementary colors. And uh, it, another one says that each roof line at each elevation shall demonstrate an offset of at least 18, 18 inches. So, I mean, they are very specific. And in, I'm just wondering, from the standpoint of developers, what types of <coughs> costs might be associated with the types of, um, of uh, recommendations. But they're not recommendations. They're really requirements because of the, the word shall. On those particular shells, if I could address those, um, first the two uh, shell require a minimum of two color schemes. Every multifamily development project and pretty much every single family project that we do see come to the planning department does have at least two color schemes. Um, we did try to allow for some generalization, one being one color being the main body of the home, two being the trims. Um, per typically you do see those two contrasting colors in all development. Um, in terms of the offset plane, that was actually an existing regulation that we brought into the proposed design guidelines. Okay. All right. Well, I'll leave the rest of my questions actually for, or comments for after the public hearing. Okay. Uh, Matt, did you have a question as well? Yeah. Um, I just, from what I'm understanding, what I'm remembering, uh, a lot of these design guidelines came from our meetings that we had in the library uh, community rooms, is that right, with the public? And there was a lot of input on design guidelines and so yes, forth. I'm going to let the planning director probably address that one since I wasn't in attendance to those meetings. Right. Just a couple um, historical items. Elizabeth Cullinan, planning director for the city. Um, the design guidelines that are adopted currently really relate to the commercial areas of the community. This is meant to be residential, but there were a series of um, advisory and mandatory elements in those guidelines as well. And just to get back to the mayor's <coughs> question on the shalls and shoulds, we were very careful about looking at those that might present some type of a hardship and actually did quite a bit of outreach with some of the design professionals and developers in the area, and they didn't have opposition uh, to that. But the shalls and shoulds are very important, as, as you've indicated, and as policymakers, you want to pay special attention to those, and if they're ones that you want to change the language, that's something that we would be happy, we're receptive to. The other thing in response to uh, Mayor Teagle Doherty's question about how this might affect density or height, it doesn't at all, essentially. It does not affect density or height. It, it just deals with facades. 
So there shouldn't be an economic impact. Hopefully it will be um, providing value to the aesthetic appearance of the multifamily areas. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Matt has a couple of additional questions. The, um, the other question I wanted to ask, I didn't see um, anything in here related to um, window placement. And we do that, I think, with single-family residential. This is multifamily residential, but in, in single-family, it seems to me one of the things EDCC looks at is do you have windows that are directly across from each other or you're offsetting those? And I don't see anything of that kind in here. We haven't codified uh, the requirement for a window placement plan in either single-family or multifamily, but we commonly ask for them in both if there's um, going to be a significant privacy issue. So, so it is something that staff's aware of and you ask for it and try to work with the developer? On a regular on basis, yes. Um, the second thing had to do with just articulation on the sides of the structures because going back to the part that Tom had a question about with the setbacks, um, interior side versus exterior, again, with single family, what we do is as you go up, you go in. And um, you can't necessarily do that in multifamily, but what you can do is have building articulation, meaning having decks or things on the side that set in a little bit. You might have a railing, but you don't have a wall face right next to you. Um, and again, in terms of those things being juxtaposed, uh, juxtaposed to each other, um, I don't see anything in here about that either. Am I being unclear or clear? <laughs> Can you restate that? Yeah, I'm just Thank I'm you. talking about building articulation in terms of decks, insets, uh, features that can uh, so, so that you don't just have a wall that goes straight up, and then you get you know you have that. A lot of what we're seeing are these sideways buildings, what people are calling sideways buildings, and if one goes up and it's just a solid wall, and then the next guy puts his up and he's a solid wall, I think we're going to have some problems in the future. Well, there are two proposed um, elements of the design review guidelines under 050, which is A6 and 7. They talk about um, stepping back so you have a tiered appearance for the upper levels and also for having... Um, uh, it's page 8, uh, Matt. Page 8? Yeah, right where you are. Uh, okay. Okay, so that so the one would be the should be set back statement, and what's the other one then? Actually, um, one uh, um, that the building elevations will modulated. be modulated through the use of setbacks, projections, and or recesses. Okay, all right. So that does. I'm sorry, I missed that uh, A1. Okay, um, and in asking those two questions, I think I've answered my third, so I won't ask my third. Thank you. Okay. Matt, could you clear the one about the windows? Because uh, the way I read uh, articulation, they did address the windows. That's sort of the same issue. I'm on page seven. Page seven? Page seven or page eight? Well, I'm looking at the mm -hmm. amended one. Ordinance. Uh, the, the one that's in version? Ordinance form, yes. Yeah. Might be on seven fewer yeah. words. Yeah. yeah. Where are you looking, Mike? I'm looking at the amended one, the last one we were given us on page seven under building articulation for windows. So I had kind of the same issue. Three. All windows and window frames shall be inset, and then later there's four on the decorative. What I'm driving at is this is a facade issue, not really the placement. Is that right, Liz? Or that's correct. Right. Yeah. So. And and what I'm talking about is not. You're talking about when they're side by side and the windows looking. Is that yeah, that they're directly yeah, across. I understand it, but I, I think this is addressed. The facades, because right. that's correct. And if you wanted right. to incorporate uh, an opposing window study requirement, that's something certainly you could do. Okay, Don, did you have a question? Yeah, I've got a couple questions. On page, I'm looking at the first draft. On page two of the proposed ordinance, uh, section 18030, 18.30.040A, um, where the chart talks about um, for newly created lots, whenever you're combining a lot. I'm sorry, Don, are you using the, this new one or the He's old one? I'm in the old one, one for, okay. for right so now again, anyway. But it's, page two. That's the reason I give you the, the section. Bottom. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's on the second page, give yeah. or take. Okay, and there's a little chart there. And in the R3 area where you're creating a lot uh, by presumably combining lots, um, and most of the lots, I have to presume, and I'm just I'm going to play for an exception here, just to, to play devil's advocate for a second. Let's say that there was a 5,000 square foot lot, and it in theory was going to be combined with an adjacent 5,000 square foot lot, therefore coming up with 10,000 feet miraculously. What if in in doing a survey, 
which undoubtedly would have to be done for financing as well as a whole lot of other purposes. One of those lots, instead of being 5,000 feet, turned out to be 4,980. Let's just say it was 20 feet short. Um, what would happen? Would there be, uh, I mean, everybody acted in good faith. We're approximately 10,000 feet. Uh, or would you say, oh, sorry, got to go buy another lot? Well, it's happened, or people have conducted lot line adjustments or abandonments of right-of-ways, but it is their responsibility to have an accurate survey at the beginning of the process. You know, I think actually what Don may be asking is I know in, in other ordinances we do have um, exceptions that can be granted from the zoning administrator. Is that right, generally? Um, and I guess maybe Don's question is, is there such an exception or would it be appropriate to have that type of exception clause added to this ordinance? There is an exception for subdivision standards currently, but it's the, it, it involves a variance type finding, so it's a very difficult exception to get. So certainly, if you wanted to have flexibility with um, lot sizes, you could add something in here. We would need to research to make sure that there was general plan consistency in terms of minimum lot sizes, um, but that's something that you could consider. Bob, did you have something that you wanted to add? It's the attorney. same thing with minimum lot size and the zoning code. Um, uh, when you need 6,000 or 7,000 square feet, that's what you need. Um, I, don't, I don't recall granting variances so that you could have, you know, 5,800 square feet. I mean, that's the minimum lot size. And, and they're throughout the zoning code and throughout uh, the subdivision uh, ordinance, too. I can just comment on that, Don. I, I know what I see in, um, in other cities, again, in single family, and, and this happens a lot, where most of the lots are supposed to be 6,000 square feet, say, for instance. And then you got a client who's at 5,000. I'm working on a project in Los Altos right now, and, and they do have, it's not really exceptions, but they have it codified so that um, where you might normally have to have a six-foot side yard setback, it, it uh, reverts to a percentage of the lot width. So if the lot is 55 feet wide instead of 60, like most of the lots, then your your side yards are five and a half feet. So they do make, there's ways to write that in. I'm not sure we want to do that tonight, but there's ways to address things like that. I agree with you that, you know, you come up short by 20 square feet, <laughs> that could be an issue. Could be an interesting situation. Again, I'm trying to avoid that by getting at what's the intent of the ordinance here more than anything else, rather than saying, hey, let's be so strict you can't do anything in the event of an exception like that. Well, I think that what the answer is is that you don't subdivide or you don't combine the lots and you create two different projects instead of the one if you can't do it under the guidelines of the ordinance. But that's not necessarily what the real goal of this ordinance is. It seems to me the goal of this ordinance, which gets on to my second issue, well, I'll come back to the other one, uh, I just kind of ask myself the question of, uh, you know, does this ordinance in potentially increase density? Because that's what potentially we're looking at. Uh, but does it do it in a way that uh, provides for more aesthetic buildings, better looking buildings? And I think it does do that. Um, does it um, promise more housing supply by what it implies? And does it does it promote more a more village like or we, we've done our best here to potentially try to legislate what charm is, and that's that's difficult to do, but I understand the intent, and that part I don't quibble with. Um, but when I look at, you know, I, I think it does a fine job on aesthetics and the village-like features, and, and this is something that all of us have argued about for a long time, or not, not in an argumentative sense, but have advocated for a long time. We said, look, if you're going to build something, we want it to be good looking. We don't want it just an ugly box up there, and we don't want to a piece of trash building, as I would say in, in my business. Uh, on the other hand, there's a philosophical issue that is, uh, you know, every day that passes, it's becoming more and more uh, at the forefront of conversation, and that is how do we get appropriately greater density? Uh, how do we get appropriately greater height? How do we figure all that in so that we can provide a more, uh, you know, more numbers, frankly, is what it really gets down to in terms of housing supply particularly along the transportation corridors. And while there's a lot of lip service toward that, when we have an opportunity to enact an ordinance, it seems to me that we ought to also make sure that we are, at a minimum, allowing for increased density and allowing for a greater housing supply. 
uh, whether we're actually promoting it specifically or not, we need to specifically allow for that. Um, just only because from a philosophical standpoint, presuming we all agree with that, and maybe we don't, but from a philosophical standpoint, San Carlos, just like in theory, every other city in the Bay Area should at least do its part. Otherwise, none of our kids or grandkids are going to come close to being able to live here. Uh, not that that's the only goal in life, but it's at least part of one because costs are skyrocketing and it's all supply demand. So, I mean, that's the philosophical argument there. So my question to you, Liz, would be, in, in these changes, while we're certainly providing for the aesthetic side of the argument, how are we providing for the density or the housing supply side? Through this ordinance, we aren't. You have several tools which you um, have already, which are your density bonus allowances. Planned community zoning is another option to um, exceed either height or density, although the general plan allows a very generous amount of density or units per acre. So you've got the tools there already. If you want to build them into the um, legislative regulations, you can certainly do that. But again, we would need to take a look at the general plan and make sure there was internal consistency with that and um, also look at the potential growth impact so we could do the appropriate environmental documents for the council. Well, so I'll leave that to your one, discussion. One add on that I actually, you know, tagging off of what Don was saying, you know, there's a, this chart on density on page three. And I'm curious um, why we're stating the maximum number of units rather than the minimum number of units. Again, in our work program, we had um, the task to prepare design guidelines. And uh, at this point, we haven't proposed increasing densities beyond that. Most of the lots that we see are fairly restricted. Um, we're happy to um, take further direction from the council if you'd like to look at density issues. And um, well, how often do ordinance changes come back before council? These are generally reviewed, what, once every five years or something like that? It depends. If you're doing a comprehensive update, it would be less frequently. But if you're doing periodic updates, so when, for example, when was this ordinance last brought before the this council? This came back probably or was here about seven years ago. So it's not brought back on a frequent basis? No. Okay. Yeah, and my goal in bringing this up is, again, not to just jam a bunch of units in those areas surrounding downtown, for example, because those are the R3, R4 areas. But it's more to provide, I, I kind of want my cake and I want to eat it too is what it really gets down to. And I think that that's actually possible if we get creative and if we just insist on the aesthetic portion of what you're proposing here in terms of changes. But I want to make sure that in some way, maybe it's not in this set of ordinance changes, but I want to make sure that in some way that we are doing our part because I think that's important that we do that. Now, we're going to have some major projects potentially coming up in the next year or two or three or beyond that we're going to have a chance to put our money where our mouth is as a council and as a city. Uh, and I'm going to want, I mean, uh, I'm going to want to see, if I'm looking at these things at all, I'm going to want to see good looking projects. But I'm also going to want to see some increased density as appropriate for a neighborhood. I'm going to want to, I want to, the best of all worlds, I want the best minds to come through that way. And so that's kind of the challenge that I put out there. And if this deals with aesthetics essentially, that's fine. But I, want to, I, would, I just want to keep in the back of our heads that we need to keep in, in mind some density issues, too. And just a quick background. Salvatore's is probably the best example, recent example, of where there was a density bonus planned community and um, exceeding the density per acre permitted um, in that district. So it can be done. But certainly um, through this ordinance um, or through your envisioning process or through the general plan update that I think you're envisioning in the future, those are other avenues you could look at. Yeah, Liz, actually... Getting back to page three under density, it says for a minimum parcel area of 10,000 plus, which is 10,000 to whatever, 100,000 square feet, correct? I'm sorry, say that again? Say on page three under density, right. under the minimum parcel area of 10,000 plus, right. that's 10,000 and anything above 10,000. That's correct. Um, it shows a maximum number of units of 20. That's correct. So we could have a huge parcel and under this existing ordinance only allow 20 units on that parcel. That's how it's written. It has presented problems in the past, but that's generally when people have gone to plan communities other, or other more creative zoning opportunities. And so we're it seems forcing, to me maybe we just want to add a plus a re, after the 20 We're forcing a rezoning there. essentially mm -hmm. on and all of the administrative overhead that goes along with a rezoning to a planned community and having to make those findings as well in order to allow increased densities. You could certainly add another tier. Okay, Bob wants to chip in here. I, uh, if you were to change this to accomplish uh, what you're talking about, you could 
um, indicate that for the 10,000 square foot lot, 20 is the maximum number of units, and to exceed that would require uh, the use of plan development, zoning, and consistency with the general plan. That way, I mean, you still need the ability. You still need the ability to control what density is going to go on the parcel. You can't just say 10, 20 plus units. You could build 2,000 units. Um, you need some control. And the control we've used in the past, and I think it would be consistent with someone coming through with the development uh, of a size like that, would be plan development zoning for uh, anything that would exceed the uh, 20, uh, 20 units per 10,000. So you mean actually feet. planned community, not planned plan community. development? Same thing. The PC zoning. Mm -hmm. Why don't, can we say that? Yeah, you can. You yeah. can put that Does as that an asterisk, and we can add a line right. that would put that in and allow for greater uh, density. And uh, staff has indicated that's effectively what we've done in the past. Right. Um, and this would memorialize that. Okay. Okay, and I have one last question, and it's in that right under that chart where we're talking about lot coverage C, and I just want to clarify that, you know, for example, just to pick on R3 zoning districts have a 65 percent. This is uh, aggregate lot coverage, I believe. Um, are we really saying under the, with with a restriction like this um, that that these are these proposed projects are going to be parking driven? I mean, that's really what it gets down to because you got to provide parking. They often are, yes. Okay. So your point was. And my point was just to clarify that. Regardless of what this says in terms of percentages, they really are parking driven. Just to say it. I, I so just two quick ones, Madam Mayor. One was your because the issues requested are already covered. But in this same chart, we're on this density issue. Um, it's a clarification that Bob brought up about anything above the 20 unit level. And did I understand, Liz? Are you going to put a minimum on this in this chart or not? Is that yeah. So I, I think I'd be much more comfortable with um, minimums rather than maximums. Madam Mayor, uh, uh, through the chair, I don't see how you could do that. If, the, for example, in the 5,000 square foot lot, four was a minimum, then what would be the maximum? No, I'm not and suggesting taking those those numbers and making those numbers the minimums. Mm -hmm. However, to to effectively have a minimum column as well, and so that it ensures that and density on some of these larger lots is not below our expectations in terms of providing appropriate levels of density so that it would be, for example, a 10,000 square foot lot, the minimum may be 15 units, the maximum may be 20 because we want to encourage density and encourage um, increased densities within. So do you see what I'm saying? And I don't know what the what the appropriate minimums would be. I mean, if we're going to go with what Don was talking about, encouraging housing, then we've got to set some kind of Exactly. Levels. And, and again, I'm not suggesting taking what we currently have as our maximums and setting those as our minimums. I don't think that would be responsible or appropriate. However, I, I do believe that there is probably um, some levels of minimums that, that really more send the, the message from a policy standpoint that um, we're looking at, you know, increased densities. We'd be happy to look at that. That I think we need to be very careful of quantifying that amount right. because there are so many individual um, situations with property, development teams, um, financial profiles that if somebody couldn't put the minimum, they may be discouraged as well. So I think we'd have to do some pretty detailed study to try to figure out what the minimum would be for different lot sizes. Well, I think, I mean, I think it, it actually probably would be a fairly easy calculation because you've got an open space requirement, right. you've got right. a parking requirement, and then if you figure two stories as a minimum and then three to four stories as a maximum, that's probably going to give you a range based on a, a, an average, you know, unit size. Actually, Madam Mayor, that was the suggestion. If you remember this Daniel Inescu's GPS system, and that was a recommendation I was going to make, that we would get an overview and we would have an inventory mm -hmm. under the GPS system of the densities per these three zones, R3, G and four, and that we would have a record of it and have what you're calling a detailed system. He did this for on a countywide, but offered that system, and I'm suggesting that we might consider might want that. Might consider taking a look at that. Um, Certainly. Then the second one is just really for me because maybe Matt, you can explain it. But these rear yard and front yard setbacks, can't we put that in a grid form that's a little bit, you know, for the layman, like you did for the minimum parcels? 
So I'm, I'm on page three again. I'm just using the front and rear yard setbacks for 15 foot minimum, front and rear yard. And then you go down the interior sides, and it's for 30 foot or less, for 31.1 up to 40, for 40.1. Can't we gridize that so that somebody can come in and not get. Because sure, there's subsequent to. references on the interior yard side. So it's just. I mean, make it a little more user friendly, even though the people who are reading it, you know, are architectural. But someone who, like this gentleman, that was and was complaining about the four foot height, I'm sure that once he sees what the regs are, a uniform building code, it's a little bit easier to understand. Okay. Uh, one more question, if I might. Matt has another question. Um, since we've been looking at the setbacks, it occurred to me that. Um, again, I'm comparing a lot of this to what I see in R1 zoning, which is what I deal with all the time. And what even San Carlos currently has in R1 zoning is um, to encourage this building articulation. We've got a setback of, like on the second floor, in most cases, seven and a half feet. And then you can pop into that with a bay window for half the width of the room that that bay window's in. Things like that encourage some building articulation, and I'm not seeing that in here. And I'm wondering if we could look at ways to to do that. Even I, and I, even on the front of buildings, like in San Francisco, one of the things they do is that the reason you see all those bay windows all over San Francisco is because they actually encourage that with their zoning. They, that's sort of bonus square footage that you get if you put a little pop out on there. And it turns out being something that people like. It adds, like, say, articulation to the building, and you know, you those have a bay to look at too. So What's that? They have a bay to look at. Yeah. yeah, we do have that in the existing ordinance, so <laughs> yeah. um, we can do that today. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, we also um, have the flexible setback allowance. Okay, you can get through a use permit, so that helps with articulation. Okay. Okay, this is a public hearing. Um, are there members of the public that wish to address the council on this uh, proposed ordinance amendment? Seeing none, uh, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second? Yeah. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion is carried. So um, is there discussion or what's the pleasure of the council? We could have a, just a comment or two on this question of uh, a minimum. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that, and I don't suppose there's any reason we couldn't do it. But I wonder if that's more of a market-driven thing than it is a mandatory thing. Uh, do we really find a, a lot that's eligible for 20 units that somehow comes in in 10 or 8 or 6? It just doesn't seem to happen. Um, so I just wonder if, if, it's, if it's valid to burden the record and burden the ordinance with a, a minimum when I believe the market forces uh, seem to take care of that. The only time, if I can speak to that, Tom, the only time I've seen it done is in housing development developments like on golf courses and so forth again in single family where they have a minimum house size and it's because they're after a certain market and they want to right. see a certain size house a certain quality house um, but I've never seen it done in multi-family uh, residential. Well, we, are, we are talking about multi-family here this, yeah. That's yeah. Right. this is not issue. single family. And the second issue uh, why I kind of side with the mayor on this one is that what we're trying to do is uh, yes the market will drive it in. Somebody's not going to come in with a you know with a you know, uh, something other than the maximum. But what happens is you end up with multiples of two and three, and we've been talking about this with the railroad land use. Is it better to have two, three bedrooms, or is it better to have, you know, four one bedrooms? Mm -hmm. Or uh, in, in terms of the, the type and lifestyle that we have and what you're encouraging in these areas is, is maybe a little different. We notice it with uh, Pacific Hacienda. Um, sometimes remember now but again Matt we're talking multiple family yeah, dwellings no, here. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't you That's wouldn't all. endorse so uh, stipulating the size of units. Yeah. yeah. You, the size of units as well as the number well, of units. No, but it's just the, the minimum units we're looking yeah. at, you know. Right. The, the thing about that though Mike is if you if you stipulate the minimum number of units you're going to end up driving the kind of units and the number of bedrooms that are in there. Because that's that's another thing that a developer is going to look at. Yeah. I'm siding with Tom because I would rather leave it to the experts, mm -hmm. just like you guys are the experts in financing and banking and so forth, you know, leave it to the developers, Chris, uh, the Chris's of the world, I, you know, they know how to put this stuff that. together. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think my perspective, though, is is really, I mean, we're looking out for the next five, ten years, and 
clearly we're already in a, a housing crunch. There's not enough housing. We're going to continue to, to keep hitting up against that. And I think that from a policy standpoint, we need to send a message that we're looking at minimum housing development. This is, this is an opportunity. These are infill lots or potentially new developments that are coming to town. We desperately, I think housing, the more housing we have in town, that solves a bunch of problems. It solves um, some of the traffic problems. It solves some of the air pollution problems that are associated with not enough people being able to live here in town. And it also allows, you know, for more of a diversity. So I think, you know, from a policy standpoint, I don't think that this is, that this ordinance is going to come back before council for the next five or seven years. I really don't. And I think that, um, it, it, we have the opportunity now, and I wouldn't, you know, if, if there's support for looking at minimums, I would suggest that we continue this item, allow staff time to do some homework and be able to come back to us with what the minimum, minimum should be that would not be a, a developmental hardship um, or would be inappropriate, but that clearly send much, much more of a message around um, we as a council recognizing the need to have minimum densities um, as well as making some um, accountability or making some um, way for developers who are looking at larger or lot consolidation for larger than 10,000 square feet, making it easier for them as well to um, not have to go through the whole planned community as well because you know, some of these standards are um, the things that you would, you would generally see in a planned community anyway. I think as long as we're practical on this we, and we don't end up with, with a, uh, a subdivision, uh, you know, a condominiumized subdivision or an apartment subdivision, so to speak, uh, that you end up with a whole bunch of, you know, you end up with five studios. I mean, not, there's not the matter of studios, but that's probably not what you're trying to encourage. You want that as a mix as opposed Correct. And, to and a I dominant don't, thing. I don't think that you would have mi the minimum so high that you'd be <clears throat> forcing, um, I mean, there's, there's two ways you can hit density, height. So instead of two stories, they're going to put a third story on in order to meet the density. Um, or they're going to play with the, the mixture and the types and the size of the units. And so I think from my perspective, I'd love to see staff come back with a recommendation that's based on what would be appropriate numbers and, and also work with some of the developers to find out what would make sense. And really just it's, it's really more sending the message that we're looking at minimums I don't think we ought to set that threshold so high that we're forcing developers to build 20 studio apartments on a 7,000 square foot lot because that's the minimum, but that it's, it's something that's reasonable and balanced and appropriate. I think as long as we're dealing with R3 and R3G and R4, which are generally level land, not always, but in just about always, uh, and so therefore we may have some exceptions again too just for, for unlevel land that may cause some problems, but as long as we're in areas that are flat, that are they're fairly uniform, I think we could give that a shot. Uh, I, I, I agree with Matt, though, that it's going to be market-driven. And mm -hmm. uh, since we live in a free enterprise society, uh, just about everybody who's building on a, on a combined piece of land or on a parcel of land is going to try to get the maximum number of units anyway because that's where they're going to maximize their profit. So I don't think that there's lack of incentive uh, on a, a private party standpoint. On the other hand, I don't think it would hurt to put some market realistic minimums in, even though the, it may be redundant. But on the other hand, it shows that we're trying to encourage some minimums yeah. anyway. And uh, I, I agree with you, Matt. Let, let the market find its own level. But I, I found that we only had one comment from John, who was the only developer. Uh, I'd kind of like to see, you know, looking at two, I think Chris would be a pretty good start. Let's do a Chris Workman, mm -hmm. John. And then the Dioli, who the, these are the three or four large, they have, all have significant apartment house R3s and 4s. These are the people who are impacting. And, and I would agree that, you know, if we come back, you get a pushback from the, from the developers saying you're really constricting us doing this. And then I agree with you. We're not here to force the market, the market forces, went the market to level itself. Well, and, and just with all due respect to what Don's comment about um, developers going to maximize, I found actually in talking with developers that, they actually don't. And the reason that they don't is because they don't feel that there's the political will for the increased density. And I think we need to, we need to start to um, let them know that they're, at least it's worth considering and that there's an openness. Okay, so um, we do we want to discuss this or are we going to uh, continue it? Do we want to?
Do we want – yes, staff, get up. Tell us what we should be uh, considering here. <laughs> Let me just summarize the direction I have from you, um, and thank you for that. Uh, first, um, we're going to be looking at um, minimum um, amounts of density per um, lots and also looking at lot size exceptions. There are just a couple of points of clarification, uh, if I could. First, I wouldn't limit the um, – the number of units to the 20 on the 10,000 square foot lots only by plan community ordinance because you can do it now by density bonus. So we may want to cross reference both options. Um, the other thing is we do have a minimum um, unit size right now in the ordinance as it's written. And then finally, did, we, did you want to provide some direction to us on the shoulds and the shalls? Anything that you feel is imperative for design guidelines versus needs more flexibility? I, I have one, um, and that is the item six on page eight so it's item a6 i suppose and the thing i remember from the meetings we had in the library the community meetings is tom richmond uh, richmond he showed us a lot of buildings that did exactly that that stepped back as they went up and his point was these are bigger buildings they're dense but and and he i remember him putting up you know example after example of here's a big building here's a big building and the ones that people responded to positive in, in a positive fashion were the ones that as they went up they stepped back or maybe they might have had a uh, upper level arcade with just columns and a little roof structure but so it you know it opened up a bit and so what I was hearing from the public is that's what they wanted they wanted to see that in San Carlos and I think if we just leave this as a should statement um, most cases, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Salvatore's, uh, no offense to John, but he did not want to, you know, he, he wanted that thing to go straight up on the El Camino, and that's pretty much what he got, and he didn't want to step it back. Well, and, it's, yeah. and it's, you know, I understand it's yeah. a dollar. Matt, issue, actually, if, if you read John's email about, he, he actually sent an email to uh, staff about this, and he in it he writes, multi-floor housing is all about lining up the structure, both horizontally and vertically, um, it's particularly true in wood frame construction in the peninsula where earthquake risks drive the design of the structure. Stepping back upper floors works completely against the fundamental principle of multi-floor housing construction. And yet? And, and I tend to, I think what, what we're, that's why it is a should instead of a shall, um, in that, you know, there's other places in terms of building articulation and everything else that um, satisfy the breaking up of the facade and the allowance of having them sort of step back. And I understand that, and I understand the setback issue. That's why I keep comparing this to residential and the work that I do, because I see the ordinances we have in single family and the onus and the expense it puts on the homeowner. Believe me, I know when you set on the side yards, when you set back and you've, and you've got a single family house with a five foot setback on the ground floor and planning staff says to the applicant, sorry, you've got to be seven and a half feet on the second floor. My structural engineers go, this is great, you know, I can't transfer shear two and a half feet very easily, and guess who pays for it? The homeowner. So if we can do that to the homeowner, we can do it to the developer. That's, that's my feeling on it. If we want architecture that's interesting and, and also responds to the community, the community said, via those pictures that were put up at, at that Appreciate seminar, at Appreciate that workshop, you. we like this. We don't like that. So I think it needs stronger language. I think it needs to be a shell statement. All right. Is there other council members that share? I, I share his opinion because the very point he made was it was a building in Palo Alto, if you remember, the one yep. right on University Avenue had the setback. And it was actually bigger than the, mm -hmm. <laughs> than the Sherwald building. Right. And yet, uh, architecturally, it was more uh, aesthetically appealing. But structurally, it had the same um, earthquake issue. So I'm not sure that I buy uh, John's argument about the uh, earthquake part of it, because um, there, there is a way. I, I'm not an engineer, and I'm there, not there's there. a way. It yeah. takes a little gymnastics. Yeah. It's not hugely expensive, but but it is again. It's an the onus we put on the right. single family. Right, so. by going up. Yeah. Okay. All I would have is a is a question: When does it set in? Does the second floor automatically get set back from the first? Uh, third automatically from the second? Or maybe we have a situation where second, and third can be okay, and the fourth goes back. I mean, if we're going to define it, we better define it, uh, or else allow it to be a shell. Uh, I'm just not sure that every <coughs> building that's built has to be stepped up floor by floor just because there's another floor. 
Well, especially when I look at a lot of the infill projects that have been going in um, within our downtown area, and the lots are so narrow anyway, yeah. that if you required a setback on some of those, they, they couldn't go up past the second story. I mean, it would be, they'd be at, you know, a 10-foot width, and, and I don't think that's realistic. Yeah. Don? I think uh, John Bear's comment does have some merit from a structural standpoint, just given, given the nature of what, what it costs to build things. I think that uh, shall is, is very desirable, but I also think that uh, given the whole tone of what this code section is about, if, if someone is trying to build a project of any size, they're going to read that code section. They will get the idea that we need good-looking buildings, that we need some articulation in the facade, that we would like some step backs on the upper floors. Uh, and when you put shall in there rather than should, that seems to indicate that that's the only way you can do it. And I think that there's a lot of ways that you can produce a good-looking building. You can do it with colors, you can do it with window boxes, you can do it with facade variations, you can do it in a lot of different ways that don't structurally affect your costs. Whereas if you say, it shall be this way, regardless, you're gonna end up with a wedding cake sort of a sort of a building. I'm not sure that's exactly what we want either. I think you leave that up to the architect and and if it's not right in the end, it won't get approved. But at least you allow someone who has the creative license to try to to read this code, to understand what we're really trying to get at, and staff is certainly going to explain to them what we want. And by the time it gets to Planning Commission, time it gets to City Council, if it comes to the City Council on appeal, or if it's big enough, or for whatever reason, uh, then someone's going to find out. But this is clear enough in terms of its intent that I think that should should work. Okay. So where staff are we? have enough and direction on it? I think I counted three shoulds and two shells. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we'll bring this back to you then, and thank you very much. Okay, so at this time we'll go ahead and uh, continue this item, and at that time reopen the public hearing. Madam Mayor, can, we'll I, can, I, can I ask staff though that we that we disc that we run this by the um, multiple, multi multiple family dwelling people who have built in this town already, and we have three. That we have up. already, right. and uh, through yeah, um, one response from two John. associations as well, yes, an Architects Association, Design Professionals Association. And these are the only comments we've gotten. The three comments that uh, Ms. Bertolo Davis mentioned were the ones we received. You know, the other one I would like to suggest is perhaps um, staff contact Dan Ionescu and see if he has some recommendations in terms of minimums. Uh, and things like that, that at least as a starting point for staff to, to consider it may not be the right thresholds again for San Carlos, but it certainly um, may be, he may be able to give you some guidance in that area. That's good. And just a closing comment on the lot size exceptions. It's a sort of a common misunderstanding that when we say 10,000 square feet for minimum lot size, that doesn't apply to condominiums and townhomes, for example. Those are exempt from the lot size standard. So you might have a 5,000 square foot lot that you can build a certain number of units on. It doesn't mean that the lot has to be 10,000 square feet. You can still develop that lot. So okay. just for background. All right, great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, moving right along, uh, under 9A, discussion and direction on the next steps for the Enhancing the City of Good Living Initiative. Jeff Mulby. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, this agenda item before you this evening is there for the purpose of providing the Council with the opportunity to review and update the public on uh, the initial steps of the Enhancing the City of Good Living Initiative. Uh, if you'd like, I could begin with some brief background on what's taken place so far, or we could just turn it over to the council to sort of talk about their impressions so far and where we're going next. Well, I would say we could probably just do a, a very brief staff report. Again, just kind of obviously you've been very good in terms of going through the background in our staff report, in terms of the history of this initiative. Um, but maybe perhaps focus a little bit on the, the key findings, the key areas, and where staff's proposing that we go, or where we actually as a council suggest that we go with some of these and then go from there. Terrific, thank you. Uh, on June 17th uh, and July the 5th, uh, the City Council uh, uh, met uh, in City Hall with uh, their consultant from MIG to begin discussing uh, what types of issues and topics uh, they'd like 
uh, the public to discuss as part of the Enhancing the City of Good Living initiative. And uh, uh, to my recollection, the council spent about seven hours uh, uh, coming up and identifying these issues. There were three outcomes of this process. We're calling them outcomes because they'll be moving on to another forum uh, in, uh, other than the Enhancing the City of Good Living, and they are uh, economic vitality, which the council asked be referred to the Economic Development Advisory Committee as it's being reformed, uh, land use issues, which the council uh, recommended go to the Planning Commission as part of an update to the land use element of the general plan, and housing, which they recommended uh, go to the EDAC housing subcommittee as it's formed, and then also uh, become part of the uh, uh, general plan update that uh, council is asking for uh, to take place, uh, likely beginning sometime in 2006. Uh, the three areas that the City Council uh, wanted to create new community task forces as part of the Enhancing the City of Good Living process are transportation and infrastructure, uh, community building, and natural resources. Uh, the original scope for this uh, project would call for a uh, community meeting on each of these items beginning in September uh, to bring in subject matter experts to talk to the Council and the community about best practices, and things that are going on in those, those uh, uh, selected uh, topic areas. Again, transportation and infrastructure, community building, and natural resources. Uh, after those, uh, or actually at the end of each of those uh, presentations, members of the community will be invited uh, to sign up for a task force uh, that will be made up of city staff, uh, interested members of the council, and community members to go out on their own and study the item uh, further. Uh, based on the timeline uh, that was passed again, these three meetings would take place September, October, and November, and then the community task forces would begin to come back and report to council uh, uh, January, February, and March of 2006. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, questions, Matt? Um, Jeff, have, w one of the things I remember when Mike and I were working on this as, even as an ad hoc committee was just in terms of budget and how much this all was going to cost. And so now that we've, as we've moved along and we're developing this with the uh, advice of MIG, now we can see where we're going to go possibly um, based on tonight's discussion, but you've got it pretty well laid out here. Do we have an idea then of where the expenses are going to go as well? I think we're still very much on target for that twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar range for MIG services, with probably another five or six thousand dollars of costs in terms of uh, marketing it and doing outreach to get the community involved and providing updates and things. Uh, we came in slightly under what we um, uh, what our number of topic meetings would be, uh, but we've already we already took one extra meeting with the council to come up with the items, so. I would say maybe we're just a little under right now, uh, but I think as the process goes on, even if we're just talking about a thousand or two dollars, I'd rather reinvest that money into uh, uh, the initiative to to do more outreach or provide. A, a, a but Jeff, that's should I mean obviously what I think Matt's asking is is that if there's significant changes or if there's changes to um, the budgeted amount that's been uh, approved for this, you would come back to council with that request for additional monies? Oh, certainly. If it was going to overrun uh, the contract, we would definitely be coming back. Um, if it's Dr. Matt, I had the exact same question. Just maybe not at this meeting, could at the subsequent meeting, just give us a, you know, where are we in terms of how, how much we spent so far? Because oh. I think we're probably, that's all I was asking. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I agree with the program, and we, I do know we had an extra meeting, but I think we should be well within the, all within the budget amount. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I talked to MIG Can you about. Just give it. Us one? We haven't seen a bill yet from MIG, so. Oh, okay. uh, uh, but I did talk to him after the last workshop. An hourly and, rate, as I recall. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there were certain services that were sort of preparation. Into There's the probably contract. preparation time yeah. and things like that as well. Uh, yeah. There. If you could just ask them, and then I don't know that we necessarily need to discuss it at a council meeting, but just get it in our packets so that we all have that information. I think that would be probably helpful. We'll continue to track that, and if there's any change, we'll let you know. Okay. Um, I had one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, one question regarding timing. Uh, we're, we're quite uh, well defined in terms of the last three transportation, 
community building and natural resources in that they'll start by November and finish by March. Could we also get a report from EDAC and from planning in November with a final report in March as to where those projects lie because they are more or less in-house and we want to make sure that uh, they too move toward a conclusion. I think the land use general plan is going to take you know, some time, a long time perhaps, but I would think that the economic vitality in the housing could um, kind of wrap up a report by next March. Sure. My my question actually is, um, who is our current staff um, person staffing our EDAC committee? Because I know that it was Leslie Parks. I think, I think these days it's Laura Snydman. Okay, and so um, each of the department heads or the staff people on these uh, different committees that we have are, are well aware of this and, and we'll be moving it through? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a member from the – Mike, come on up and – sorry, state your name and city of residence <laughs> for our city treasurer. Michael Galvin, um, 819 Tamarack, San Carlos. I was the former EDAC chair and for councils um, review of consideration that there are no members of EDAC at this point in time. There has been none since January. So in order for EDAC to participate with staff in some sort of report by November, um, there's going to have to be uh, some sort of recruiting um, fairly quick. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we'll get that noticed and, uh, and start that recruitment process. In fact, uh, Brian, perhaps you can make sure that Laura puts that pretty high up on her priority list. Okay, are there other questions for Jeff? Great. Um, briefly, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, in terms of... Uh, we don't allow that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. In, in terms of scheduling these meetings, um, uh, I recall discussing with the subcommittee, but not with the full council, uh, whether or not you would want it, us as staff to try to cancel one of your regular meetings and schedule this meeting in its place, or if you're prepared to go with a special meeting it's so that in September, October, and November, you'll essentially have three council meetings a month. I'm sorry, which, why would we have additional council meetings? Well, for the, the public presentation, uh, meeting, the next step in the process where the subject matter expert comes in and discusses these things with you. I, I think through the chair, Jeff's talking about the so-called kickoff meeting that MIG referred to that when we got to a point where this project came together and we were going to announce it to the community and seek volunteers, there would be a kickoff meeting. And I guess what Jeff's asking is, do you want to do that as part of one of these meetings or a separate meeting? I think, pro I mean, my, my personal preference would probably be have it as a separate meeting because I don't know how many people from the public would be willing to come and show up on a Monday night. It may be more convenient for members of the public to show up to a kickoff meeting on a Saturday morning or a uh, Thursday evening type of thing. I don't know. Are there are other? Uh, I agree. I, I just don't. I think the council meeting should be kept to council agenda type items. Okay. And this should be separate. All right. So. Okay. Yeah. So I'll work with council offline to begin scheduling that. Uh, and finally, is there any sense, uh, is there any um, order in which you'd like to see these items begin, the three items that will be going to the uh, uh, community task forces in terms of scheduling? I guess we start with transportation. You got a, you're talking about one in October, one September, one October, one November. Correct. Um, I would suggest. Actually. I was thinking community building in September because we'll find out by October kind of the impact the lack of scoot has been on the community and there may be more interest. That's why I was saying transportation. Well, but in, if we have it the very beginning of September, we may not okay. yet understand. So if we do community building first, by certainly by October's meeting, um, we'll have a much clearer picture of uh, the impact on the loss of scoot as it relates to uh, traf traffic and transportation within town. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, 10A uh, is an introduction of an ordinance amending the San Carlos Municipal Code for four-hour parking on the 1700 block of Laurel Street. We do, um, this is really considered more of a cleanup type of ordinance. 
um, in that our current municipal code requires two-hour parking in the entire length of Laurel Street. However, it's been actually posted as four-hour parking. So um, I'm seeing Bob Lanzon if there's any there's questions for no staff. No report, but just to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, Don has a question. Just a question. Uh, I noticed the signs have already been changed to four hours because I drove by there this morning. <laughs> no, they've been that way, actually. That's the reason. Well, I, well, I hadn't noticed till this morning then. Let's put it that way. Um, okay. Uh, and I guess my only question is if, if they've been two hours in theory all along, except for the time when they have been posted at four hours, whenever that actually took place, uh, What's, I mean, what, what's the motivation? Why are we doing this is, is all I'm really saying. As I understand it from uh, staff, uh, it was at the request of property owners um, in the 1700 block. And uh, there was an accommodation to change it. Uh, uh, staff felt that the uh, number of hours could change to allow the on-street parking and not interfere with uh, uh, businesses that would otherwise uh, like there aren't that many retail businesses at that end. It was more office related um, uh, uh, and, and types this, of uses at that end of uh, Laurel Street. This particular block is on Laurel Street between St. Francis block. and Eaton Avenue. It's the very last yes. block. Yeah, yeah. Just for clarification purposes. Yeah, that's and what I, I would imagine it probably that's why it's went a through ordinance. traffic and transportation <laughs> and everything else to get the uh, with the recommendations and the signs yeah. changed. It was just never carried through okay. to the actual ordinance. All right. Um, okay. Is there uh, any member of the public that wants to talk on this? Feel free to come up. It's not a public hearing, but uh, feel free to add some input here. Thank you. State my name and yeah, just name and, and city of residence. Jewel Schrang, uh, 1053 McHugh Avenue, San Carlos. And um, 10A gives me an opportunity to ask a question that has been troubling me for quite some time. And that is, um, I'd like to understand why some signs uh, the city can have the budget to change and um, for an example the four-hour parking when that section of the community um, said that there was a need and uh, obviously there were problems that um, you reacted to and and tried to help the community out and yet when McHugh Avenue and some of the other residential streets have been um, really very diligent in asking, in fact, in going through the process of um, traffic studies and so forth, and we were told that we needed 100% signatures which seems to me that that was an unreasonable um, request, except that we did meet that requirement, and yet we're told um, that the city can't afford them. And another example of signs being provided is, you know, we're told that they're too costly, and yet the scoot signs went up, right away at every bus pickup. And so it really seems to me that the city can find the budget for signs when it's something important to them and yet not the entire community. Well, um, I understand your frustration and I will defer that actually to Brian to follow through and, and let yeah, us know I, if I was just it is make a it. budget issue or well, and through the mayor, I just was going to mention that uh, my understanding is that the uh, Public Works Department and Police Department are working with uh, the L'Oreal Homeowners Association about some of these issues. I, I think it was their understanding that a formal request for some of the signing was forthcoming, and apparently that wasn't the understanding of Mr. Marsters, and so they are having a meeting, I believe it is later this week, to go through some of those. So that is in process. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else from the public? All right, is there a motion to introduce this ordinance? Ordinance 
Second. Do you need to read it? No? Okay. All right. Uh, read Kristen? An yeah, forget the color. It's an ordinance. <laughs> it is. It's just the wrong color. Can your mic on. Ordinance of the City of San Carlos amending Municipal Code Chapter 10.32 Modifications of Parking Regulation. And it was a yellow. Sorry. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> they color cord these, coordinate these for the uh, council members to keep us on the right track here. All right, uh, Christine. Councilmember King? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Davids? Yes. Councilmember Eaton? Yes. Mayor Teagle Doherty? Yes. Okay, last time on our agenda this evening before our final public comment period actually is at the request of Councilmember Grocott is the review of the Scoot Outreach Coordinator expenditures, and this is actually the follow-up item to um, our last month's meeting, or I'm sorry, our last meeting where um, we were presented with a binder outlining the uh, current expenditures to date for the outreach coordinator for Kimberly, or actually Kimberly Hartnett, who was our outreach coordinator for the Scoot shuttle bus service. Matt? Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the first thing I'd like to do here is clarify a little bit on the background portion of this memo. Um, so I have some things on background myself that I'd like to read. Um, Matt, just very quickly, yes. um, if, can I ask you just to summarize for the council what your um, main objectives are? That's what you'll get when I read this background. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, in the background, Mr. Garvey correctly states that I had concerns with the outreach coordinator services uh, provided to the city by Mactari Engineering. And actually earlier this year, I asked the question why we had overpaid in the amount of um, $7,600 for outreach coordinator services to Mactari Engineering. Um, on his contract, which so everybody understands, his contract runs from 16th of September to the 15th of September the following year. Um, I had asked that question, I seemed to have it seemed to have gotten lost in space somewhere. It never did get an answer, and uh, I waited patiently. But in the meantime, we had a staff report on the Industrial Road Improvement Project, and on that I was drilling into a portion of the project that was over budget, which to me appeared grossly out of line because everything else on the project was under budget. And as I asked questions about that, uh, one of the things I asked was who were the vendors on that portion of the work, and it came to light that one of the vendors was Mactari Eng Engineering, and the, the services provided on that uh, was Outreach Coordinator. And when I added that payment that had been made for Outreach Coordinator on the Industrial Road Project to what had already been paid on Scoot, it meant that we had not merely overpaid by $7,600, but by $53,000. So again, I asked staff for an explanation how we had overpaid on this contract, which very explicitly restricts the outreach coordinator to 700 hours in any single contract year, or in terms of dollars, $56,000. I want to clarify, I did not, as Mr. Garvey states in his memo, ask how many hours the outreach coordinator had worked on Scoot. I knew the number because I had been following it in the warrants and had built a spreadsheet for myself uh, following that. And I did not express concern that we had not authorized outreach coordinator hours on SCOOT. I never made that statement. Again, my, simple, my concern was simply how, we had, over, how had we overpaid $53,000 on a contract without council approval. And then also at the time I expressed concern that the funds used to pay for outreach coordinator services, whether for Scoot or Industrial Road, were not from the city's general fund. They were from state and federal grant monies. And it is my understanding uh, that it, it's not legal to spend money from those sources on a contractor without a proper contract, or if you already have a contract and you need to spend more money, an amendment to a contract. And uh, so my question was then, and it still is after reviewing this binder, if we had paid these funds without a contract or without a proper amendment to a contract, what liability might that be for the city of San Carlos? Um, and in fact, my concern on that latter item is heightened by the admission in Mr. Garvey's memo 
that, quote, these services were treated as if they were personnel expenditures. Uh, in my mind, they were not personnel expenditures. They were contract expenditures for which there is no contract or an amendment to a contract. And I would just reference our own municipal code, section 3.12.020, which talks about spending uh, federal assistant monies and having a contract to do so. So, Matt, um, your, two, your two questions... Your, your two questions are, again... Well, from... I, I have a number of questions here I'd like to ask, but the, the two main questions that I asked months and months and months ago uh, that I've restated in this background that I've provided is how did we pay $53,000 outside the limits of a contract, and number two, having paid that $53,000, whether it was on Scoot or whether it was on Industrial Road, there was no contract, there was no amendment to a contract. Uh, so we've paid out money using state and federal grant monies without those two items being in place. And, and, and I'm afraid that that leaves the city in uh, a situation that's, it it's, could be deemed illegal, it could be a problem for the city, I'm, I don't know. Okay, so the questions, the hours in question actually, from what it sounds like from your standpoint, are actually related to Kimberly's contractual hours, the 700 that are allowed, which um, the staff presentation and binder to us clearly proves that um, she did not spend more than the 700 hours um, that were allowed under the contract. So help me understand where this $53,000 is coming from th that's in... Um, based on your calculations? Based on my calculations is from, if you take the hours spent on Industrial Road and apparently other projects like sewer maintenance or road repaving or whatever, the outreach coordinator services that were done for that, the outreach coordinator services that were done for Scoot, in, it, it, it is over the 700 hours that's allowed for in one year's time per the contract. Correct. And the contract actually has to do with the outreach coordinator that's unrelated to SCOOT. And in that, in those hours, I mean, the attachment A that we have here clearly shows that she did not work more than the 700 hours allowed under contract. Um, and so the hours in question, I believe, that you're talking about are for the billing for her time on Scoot. Is that correct? No, it's for the two combined. Because you feel that the two combined, that her contractual agreement should have covered Scoot but didn't, should have been amended to cover the Scoot hours? Exactly. Um, if I can go into some analysis, um, it, okay. it will answer your question. Okay. In the memo that Mr. Garvey has provided, it states that the contract is for public work services, meaning Maktari's contract is for public work services, and for that reason the scoot work is not included in the scope of work. And then a few lines further down, he says the work, the hours worked by the outreach coordinator on the scoot program are an administrative matter. That's why I clarified my background versus what Mr. Garvey has written here. He's dividing the two. He's saying. We had a contract with Mr. McTarry for as public works director. Outreach coordinator services were included in that contract. And then we had no contract for outreach coordinator services on Scoot. And that was just a matter for him to manage and okay the hours and make the payments without getting approval of the council. Yeah, and I think, I think you bring up a, actually a, quite a good point. And I think it's something that we as a council need to decide from a policy standpoint, which is, what level of detail do we as a council want to um, want to control or to manage or micromanage um, on some of these projects? Because um, I would look at the industrial road project and in fact it came to us and it was broken out into you know the overall budget amount and then broken down into five or six individual types of engineers estimates, you know, pre-construction documents, approvals, construction management, the actual construction itself, and, you know, there was something else. And the same thing um, with Scoot. Scoot came before us as a budget item, but we didn't actually have it broken down necessarily by line item. 
And I would, I guess, sort of ask for input from my fellow council members about what level of detail do we as a council um, look at or would like to have when requests for some of these projects or re requests for the funding for some of these projects come before us and then also furthermore subsequent tracking of those funds. Do we want to have it actually tracked at the line item detail or do we believe that as long as it comes within the overall umbrella budget amount that has been approved by council are we comfortable with allowing the actual disbursements and the approvals of the line item details within that um, occur at, as an administrative function? With, with all due respect, Madam Mayor, that is not my question. Um, the, the fact uh, or how much detail there is in, in that we're given on, on those items that you, you discussed is really not the issue. The issue has to do with really communication because what I could tell from looking at this and studying it is that in Mr. Garvey's mind, the contract with the Public Works Director that describes what his work is in, in Attachment A and in Attachment B dis, uh, discusses what his compensation should be, he's saying that outreach coordinator that's listed there under attachment B, which is for compensation and limits it to 700 hours at $80 an hour, only relates to the public works. If, if you look at our budget, there's a, there's a uh, public works tab, and then the first thing you come to is public works administration and, and maintenance. And then you can go into other programs, mm -hmm. okay? And for instance, uh, so, so what he's saying is that that contract only covers that first part of what's in our budget item, which is public works, administration, and, and maintenance of the facilities, and, and so forth. Doesn't relate to anything else that's under that public works tab. And what I can, I can see what Mike's understanding is. He's saying Scoot didn't fall under public works, doesn't fall under the public works contract. That was not my understanding. And I don't know who else on this council had any different understanding than I did. My understanding was there's public works outreach coordinator and that person, it doesn't matter if it's Scoot, or if it's a sewer project, if it's industrial road, it doesn't matter. It's outreach coordinator services that is being provided to the city through Mokhtari Engineering. And that is limited to 700 hours at $80 an hour. And that's the contract we approved. That's the contract I approved. And I'll, what led me to that understanding is if I look at, again, if I go to the budget, it says in, in our 0406 budget, under public works, under the tab public works, there is a category, public works, maintenance division, traffic congestion management. That's where you'll find SCOOP. And the description under this category reads, under the direction of the public works director, this unit is responsible for implementation and operation of the San Carlos Optimum Operational Transit, or SCOOT. So it's saying the Public uh, Works Director is responsible for the implementation and operation of that, that project. So therefore, why wouldn't that come under his contract that we have that says, here's your duties, here's what you do, and uh, by the way, we've got outreach coordinator in there, and so that would relate to SCOOT. And furthermore, in his, if you read his contract under duties, one of the things it says is he applies for and obtains federal and state transportation grants and implements those projects. Well, how is Scoot paid for? Federal and state grants. And so his, when I read his contract, I'm just a lay person. I'm a council member like you. I work and do other things. I don't study these contracts like a lawyer. So I read this stuff. I read my budget. I read these things. And my understanding is outreach coordinator services for whatever outreach coordinator services are needed. It doesn't matter if it's Scoot, Industrial Road, Anything, it doesn't matter. It's limited to 700 hours. Um, that was my understanding. I don't know if any of you had a different understanding. If I had had a different understanding, when Scoot was coming along as a pilot program, at some point I would have said, you know what, it's fine when it was down at Laurel Street and we were doing the rebuild and you need an outreach coordinator, just do it under that $20,000. But once the program was up and running, there is no reason in, in this world why we should not have had a contract 
for Outreach Coordinator Services on SCOOT that was brought to the council for approval. That was never done. You know, Matt, I think, um, I think there's two things that, well, first of all, obviously, um, I think as a council member, you know, for my fellow council members, yes, I think that probably we should have gone back and had we known that there was a contract in place that limited the number of hours, gone back and amended it. Unfortunately, at this point, that's water under the bridge. Um, the second thing I would add is, is that um, I don't know that as a council member that I look at, because there is a contract that allows for up to a certain number of hours, um, at the end of the day, we approve the budgets, and the budgets um, control the appropriation of funds. And so just because there's a contract in place that covers the, um, the number of hours at a certain hourly rate that should have been updated, obviously, and wasn't, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we as a council have got to appropriate the funds. If we don't appropriate the funds, it doesn't matter if the contract's in place or not. Um, the money can't go forward. So let, let me, I, let me. I guess that's, that's my, my dilemma is that obviously, clearly a mistake occurred in that a contract amendment should have been made to cover the additional hours for the outreach coordinator. Um, unfortunately, I think I look at it as it fell between the cracks. I don't believe that it was done maliciously. I don't, I don't believe that it was done with the intent to defraud um, or somehow mislead the public or anything like that. Again, my perspective. Um, but I do think that we as a council approved the expenditures for SCOOT, and clearly Kimberly was part of the, the success of the SCOOT program and took care of a lot of the, the external communication. Do my fellow council members want to have – do they have anything to add or – Well, I – I guess I don't see the big deal. Um, I understand that we didn't have the contract with Kimberly for outreach or SCOOT. Uh, perhaps we should have, but I do think the city manager has the ability to, to hire someone who can perform those services, and that's what he did. If we want to change that, we can. But I think he operated under the, under the rules of play at that time. It's true that Mokhtari hired Kimberly, but I, I see no reason why the city manager couldn't approve that based on the rules of approval that we've given him. So he did that. Now, if we want to change it, as I say, we can do that. I'm not sure we should. I think we need to allow the manager, the new manager as well, to, to operate uh, as needed. I think Kimberly earned every dollar she got. I think she performed a very valuable service. And whether you like Scoot or not, I think uh, she was an asset to the program, and she helped uh, answer a lot of cl uh, questions, clarify difficult situations, communicate well with the public, and, and so I think she did a good job. Uh, I think we've, we've shown that she worked uh, appropriate hours for Parvis uh, under the 700. And we also know what, what hours she worked uh, under the, the city, city manager's authority. So, so there's, a, there's a difference of opinion, I guess, in terms of what, uh, what should have been allowed. Uh, the fact that she was paid from, from federal state funds uh, that wasn't a part of a contract or wasn't in a line item budget, uh, I'm not sure if that means anything. I think, uh, again, uh, it was a valued service for uh, or valued service she gave for the the money we paid. So I, I understand Matt's uh, Matt's frustration, perhaps, in not getting the answers that he wanted in the in the way that he wanted them. But I I do think that uh, uh, we've got the complete record here. I, I will compliment staff on putting this together. It's a it's a rather monumental job. I think it's um, it's a cradle of grave. Uh, uh, evaluation of the program, or at least in terms of the, the printed word. And I think we all have to agree at the council that we knew she was working. We knew what she was doing. Uh, if we had questions along the way, we can bring them up at any time, and Matt has. But we could have done that long ago, and uh, we could have clarified those, those uh, questions. So I, th I think it's, it's a done deal. Uh, the program's uh, uh, put to bed. Um, the work's been done. The money's been paid. I just don't don't see the problem. All right. Thanks. The other comments, Don. Not to belabor this, but I generally agree with what Tom said. I don't think we should be splitting hairs here. I appreciate where Matt's coming from on this, but uh, I think that when we hire a city manager, we give that city manager 
uh, an amount of leeway to act in the city's best interest to do the things that, that he thinks are right, and I've never seen Mr. Garvey do anything other than that. And so I don't have a problem with what he did in this instance. I'd like to hear from Mr. Garvey in the end, but other than that, I'll just keep it short and say I generally agree with Tom. Mike, do you have no, more time in here? I mean, we've, we've spent more money belaboring this than I think than uh, the overpayment. Um, and I think when we look at, at particularly industrial road, I mean, we've, we've heard enough of Scoot. You know, I think Scoot became a byproduct of, of Kimberly's outreach program. And maybe if we maybe paid her a little more money, we'd still have it around, but in reaching more people. But I'm kind of with Tom on this one. It's, uh, you know, we're going back over. What are we, what are we going to do? I mean, demand this money be repaid, uh, uh, go back and undo the, the work that she's done. Um, and particularly, I mean, you know, I'd like to put on industrial road project, too, because, you know, we had significant budgetary issues there in, in reaching the, the merchants, uh, particularly the property owners there, was, um, I don't want to say money well spent, but it was. It was money well spent. Um, and, Matt, I agree with you. I mean, you, you know, relative to the contract amount, we had, you know, we did get updates from Richard continually. And they were, for my edification, they were always in that engineering oversight, you know, that, that the one block. And we, were, we weren't looking at the overall budget. We were looking at the individual blocks. And, and I compliment you, you, we did point out, hey, we're over on this, you know, that factor of the budget, but the overall budget was in. Mm -hmm. So I guess really in, in the greater scheme of things, I think the public wants us to, I mean, the people want to, let's get on with things and let's get, you know, let's get some of this done or let's find out what something productive out of it. So. Well, I do want to do that. And I first want to remind everybody, you know, we are, I appreciate what Tom says and what Don says, you know, you want to trust your city manager and, and you give them so much leeway and so forth. But I would remind, remind everybody, we are a nation of laws, not a nation of men. That's been stated in our history. It's true, and it's not only true nationally, it's true in our city. We have a municipal code is the point. And that municipal code does allow Mr. Garvey leeway, or the city manager, of $20,000. And it would have been very easy. I've looked at this. I looked at the charts that were in here. Um, in the first year of operation, by September, September, I think it was, on one of these, um, it would have been very easy. Well, I'll, I'll look at the 0203 yeah, year, for instance. Inga, I would like to finish this. I spent I know, I know you spent a lot of time this, working on like this. I would like to finish it. But just in, there doesn't seem to be there is a point. The, same, the same issue that's, that's shared. We Look, I would like to finish this. And I can either finish okay. it from the dais or I can go down there and talk to the newspaper and finish it and you can read it tomorrow morning in the paper. I'm sure I'm sure you're gonna do that anyway, Matt, but feel free. My my point My point is that in the first year of operation, at a limit of twenty thousand dollars at eighty dollars an hour, that's real simple math, that's two hundred and fifty hours. In the first year of operation they would have known that they were at uh, close to those hours um, in February of 03. And Mr. Garvey could have come to the council then and said, look, this is how the hours are running. We need a contract. If he hadn't done that, and say he finished the first year, it was a pilot program, and he completed the first year, and he said, okay, look, first year we used 538 hours. We're going to continue this for a second year. So. Let's budget in an additional 500 or 600 hours in Mr. McTarry's contract for outreach coordinator so that we're covered in scoop. He could have done that. He did not do that. And again, I would, I would just say, you know, we, we have leeway in place. We've upped that to $50,000. We have a municipal code. It's there for a reason. We follow it. And I would suggest that what we're doing tonight should at least be a message, I would hope, from this council to the new administration that we will have in place here uh, probably by September. I would like to also point out relative to this contract uh, that the last time we signed a contract with McTari Engineering was September 16th, 2002. It's going to be three years old this September. And I would suggest that before we reach that anniversary, we put this thing out 
for RFP. We talked about it when Mike was mayor that we would do this, and we have not done it. We should do it. And we either do that or we terminate the relationship altogether and hire a city engineer, public works director, and stop having one that is a contractor. We need to do one of the t one of those two things. It's ridiculous that we have a contract hanging out there since 2002 that has never been reviewed or renewed. Um, so that's my conclusion to this uh, report. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Matt. I have a uh, speaker slip here for this item. Cece, would you like to uh, address the council? C.C. Wilkerson, San Carlos. And I had prepared a statement this evening. I'm speaking on behalf of a group. Um, but I'm changing it a little bit in light of the conversation. Um, it's good to see an understanding, at least somewhat, um, an awareness, um, it seems to be, that uh, this really was something that kind of fell through the cracks. Uh, there really should have been a contract, and that's important. Um, you know, you're up there, and at first I was kind of going along appreciating what you had to say. But what you don't seem to get is, and, and it comes back to actually this um, land of laws kind of concept, is you're up there and decisions are being made for everybody in this community. And you're up there speaking on our behalf and deciding on our behalf, but that doesn't mean we're out of the loop. We need to be clear on what's happening. There are those of us who would like to know what's happening and who do keep abreast of these things. The way we do that is by the paperwork, by the contracts, so that we can understand where our money is being spent. This money belongs to everyone out here. When every time you say it falls through the cracks, oops, it was an organizational mistake, those are opportunities we didn't get to find out what was happening with our money in our town where our kids are being raised where we enjoy the downtown, it all matters to us because see, we like the community as much as you guys do. I know I do. And I think the point, in a way, of what's going on when I listen to this, when I listen to you and I listen to Matt, is that this has been a pattern. You, you know, you say, what's up, so what? You know, what are we going to do about it? There's been a pattern, pattern over the last few years. Grand jury investigations, and apparently they have this follow-up that came out on their, of their own accord where they're still keeping tabs on what's happening because of the concern they have. They feel like we're not doing what needs to be done to really assure that conflict of interest doesn't take place. And that's not even saying definitively that there is a conflict of interest, okay? But you're not doing what it takes to make sure that the perception isn't there. And perception, I remind you, is all important in government. The ethicists, you know, over a year ago, you remember the press, that was the key thing. Public trust is first. The reason this is all happening tonight is because that public trust has eroded over the last few years. I am all for community building. I'm so glad that's the first thing in September because we don't need this. And maybe you don't want it, but this is where it's eroded to because of these constant investigations and these things falling through the cracks. The administration, it's their job to not have things fall through the cracks. You all need to make your decisions based on what he's doing. You need to feel confident that it's not falling through the cracks. This is about the new administration coming in. We want to believe that he's going to look out for that. He's going to dot those I's and cross those T's so that we can look at it and feel confident. We don't feel confident anymore. And that's the problem. And I'm hoping you will see that because we don't be, seem to be getting the respect that requires. And it is the most important thing. It truly is. If you have to spend an extra ten, twenty thousand dollars, you feel like you're not saving the money you really want to by being innovative with contractors, oh well. Hire someone who works for the city, who's loyal to the city, who we can put faith in, who has nothing else to gain, no side contracts. The public trust must come first. Otherwise, it's going to be like this because we will doubt every decision. We will always question and wonder, and that's costing you so much more. Apparently, it's cost sixty thousand dollars on this report, and it's costing so much more, and it doesn't have to. You've got to dot those I's. Let us trust you again. 
And that means not letting things slip through the cracks. And when it does, it can't be, oh, well, it has to be unacceptable. That's your job to follow up. Okay. Just a quick point of clarification, actually. No, it was $60,000 or the equivalent of, of, Cumulative staff, of, over of years, staff time. Yes. It was not uh, um, $60,000 of city funds that were spent in preparing this right. report. It was sort of the equivalent if they had been working on something else. I'm aware of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Clint Miller. Clint Miller, 2429 San Carlos Avenue. I think the, the matter of the $60,000 was clarified last time. Uh, we were told that that was five, uh, to answer five questions that uh, Councillor Grocott had asked. Uh, I think when that question came up, um, Don, you asked it, what did it cost? And uh, quite frankly, that struck me as a real softball pitch to Mr. Garvey, just happened to have that figure right on the tip of his tongue. Uh, this was political theater. I uh, then got up and suggested that it really wasn't Matt's expense. Uh, these are Mr. Garvey's ideas about contracting. And I wish to amend that. I was blaming Mr. Garvey totally for that. And uh, he is not totally at fault there. There are four council members up here who voted for that. And you, Mr. Eaton, your signature is on Mr. Mortari's first contract. It happened on your watch. Um, the other matter that, was, uh, that needs to be addressed here is who is asking these questions? Uh, it seemed to be that the finger was pointing at Matt. Let me suggest to you that there are f many people asking questions. The public is asking questions. That's why these people are here. That's why these people have been coming. That's why hundreds of people have been down here. And you people ignore it completely. The press is asking questions. The grand jury has asked questions. The district attorney has asked questions. So it's not Mr. Grokot that's just asking questions, but Mr. Grokot's doing his job. And if I take that one step farther, let me point out that there are four of you who are not asking questions, and that is the problem. You're supposed to be a deliberative body. You're supposed to be critical thinkers, and four of you are not. Now, there are additional costs to the $60,000. CC has alluded to that. We don't know what the response to the grand jury cost. That was a sizable use of staff resources. Maureen Lennon prepared a memo on staff time, did research on contracting. She came up with the conclusion that contracting is more expensive than using public employees. Now, that memo has been buried. We've never seen that. We've asked for that, and we can't find that. And then we have uh, an RFP that went out in October to hire a firm to determine whether or not we are, in fact, saving money or not. Um, I know the contract was let. Uh, I don't know what that cost. I wonder if staff might have that on the tip of their tongue. What is this contract costing? That would be the Harvey Rose. I uh, believe, if I remember correctly, solving. that the council allocated $35,000 for the Harvey Rose work. All right, that's uh, another expenditure that really should not happen. If you conducted the public's business in a manner that didn't cause questions, you'd save a lot of money. You'd save a lot of money. And finally, CC talked about the erosion of the public trust, and that's the basic issue here. Back two years ago, we had an election. Tom Davids ran and Inga Doherty ran. And they virtually ran unopposed. Uh, there was one candidate who filed, uh, but it was an unopposed election. After the election was over, there was great chest thumping. Well, we must be doing a good job because, you know, we got elected, nobody ran against us. The erosion of the public trust 
has reached the point where there are now seven candidates filed to run for this election upcoming, seven by my, my, by, by my count. And I'm aware of two additional who are thinking this over. So here we have nine people going to run. And I wonder if the logic that you used to pat yourselves on the back by running unopposed last time, if you apply that to having nine people running, what do you conclude about the job you're doing? Just actually for quick clarification, I believe it's nine people have taken out papers. Oh, really? And, I'm sorry, six people have six, taken okay. out papers. And so um, the actual who gets on the ballot is determined by who collects this, enough signatures and files. That I guarantee packet, you. I guarantee you they're all going to get signatures. Well, and we'll, I'm we'll aware wait of, and see. I'm, of, I'm aware of two additional. So we're either talking about eight or nine possible candidates here. Then, and then so I are you, are you doing a good work. job is the question. Are you doing a good job? Okay. Um, additional. Barbara, come on up. Again, name and city of residence for the record. Hi, I'm Barbara Patterson. I live in San Carlos. Um, I think actually people on the city council should be making much more money. I think we demand a lot of you. And um, so whoever's going to be city council, I think you really should vote that position much more money because we take it seriously too. I think what, what I'm observing from what I've, I've seen and participated in is I think there's a lack of crispness in terms of the letter of the law. And I think there are times when a lot of you have been working together for years. You've traded off positions, city council, planning commission, mayor. You know, you've been trading off these positions for a long time. And you've had um, some, a lot of continuity here where you all know each other. But this isn't shared on the outside with the rest of us. And I think we do feel kind of on the outside. And I think if, if these issues would come up and they'd be very public and everything delineated and not just consider we have a slush fund that it doesn't matter where the line item is or maybe we didn't do this, maybe we didn't. I mean, to have a contract going on for this amount of time with the public works director is pretty amazing to me. I didn't know that. But it is an unusual situation in the city, and I think you ought to really avoid any appearance of conflict or it's, it's just, um, it's very confusing for me. It's very hard for me to get information, especially out of public works. I think we ought to have a public works commission so that there are people that participate in the spending of the budget and the allocation of, of efforts on the public works area. And I think this is something that you all may feel comfortable with, or many of you feel comfortable with the arrangement with Mukhtari. But from my standpoint, in work, looking at what's been going on with the Creeks for the last 20 years, I think it's been very pitiful. And that's a lot of money. For, it's like half a million dollars a year um, to take care of our stormwater and our creeks and all those systems. And I think we should have had a watershed plan. We should have had all kind of things that are on a long-range basis done instead of just handling piece, things piecemeal, 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 going from one little project to another or one big project to another. So that's, that's what I feel, and I, I think that the situation where there was an extra amount of money, you know, 76, that's a lot of money. And for us to just see how casually things are voted on here, even the opening of El Camino, um, that there was a study done by Public Works. They hired someone to perform a study. Was it necessary to open those, those uh, left turn lanes? And the study concluded, no, it's not necessary. But it was done anyway, just on a very simple vote. And, and that study was not even brought up to your, to your awareness the time was vote was taken. Something like that, the, the benefits of downtown, it should have been on an assessment district. I think there just ought to be more creativity about how these things are done and not just, you know, go vote hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, just so casually. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. All right. Uh, is there anyone, anyone else that wishes to speak on this item? Come on up. Jules Schrang, San Carlos. Um, I would just like to say that um, in regard to your 
comment, Mayor, that the voters will actually be giving a performance appraisal rating um, soon. And I have seen Matt try to represent the concerns of the community. And too many times I've, I've sat here in the audience and or viewed it on TV and it appears that council and um, city manager seem to think that they know what's best for the community and not really taking the community serious. Okay, thank you for that, uh, that feedback and those comments. If there's no one else that wishes to address the council on this item, we'll move on. Um, we do have a, an additional public comment period at the end of the meeting. Again, it's uh, speakers limited to two minutes, if possible, and it would be to speak on items that are not listed on the printed agenda. Is there anyone here that wishes to address council at public comment? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you want it? Just, yes. Okay, sorry, we're not adjourned. Yes. Horst Jung, San Carlos. Again, we've been there many times before on these issues, <coughs> different issues. Matt's the guy that asks the questions. Right or wrong, he asks questions. The rest of you just go along, don't ask questions. Even if they're not, ask questions of these in these issues, and you just go along with it. Ask questions. You know, it may, it may be a, a moot point, but ask questions anyway. Otherwise, we get the impression that four of you, it's usually four to one. Why? Because Matt is the only one to ask pertinent questions unless you go along with the, with the scheme here. There were definitely ethical issues. We've been over this many times on these contracts. There's no question about it. And you just go along with, the, with it and make it possible. You make it possible for these things to happen, and there is no need for that. That's the issue. There is no need for that if you ask the right questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, last call for public comment. Okay. Now we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>